Internet, this is Adam A. Smith, and I'd like to talk today about Dungeons & Dragons Game Balance. First things first, to get out of the way, I am currently sick. Again, I know. Um, however, neither me nor actual certified medical personnel believe that it is COVID-19 at all. So, don't panic. I will be fine. Just have to currently stay in right now, because if I did catch it... I would be in big trouble if I was already sick. But that aside, you know, please follow the advice of the CDC and all that and stay indoors and all of that good stuff. Let's get to the actual topic of today's video. The balance of the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons. Or perhaps specifically in my case, Pathfinder. As I'll have to preface this by saying that I have played 5th edition D&D a couple of times, not enough to really have any expertise in it, and haven't really played 2nd edition Pathfinder at all. So if those games are more or less balanced than this system, I don't first-hand know. However, I've been led to believe that the issues I'm going to talk about today are still present within 5th and even from 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. So... I believe it will be pertinent, what I'm going to say. Now, firstly, what am I talking about? Well, when you sit down to play a game of Dungeons & Dragons, or Pathfinder, or any other tabletop game for the most part, your first step is going to be picking a race and a class. Your race is, well, who you are. Are you an elf, or a dwarf, or a halfling, or just a plain old human? Your class is your job, let's call it, your profession, your role. Are you a nimble and sneaky rogue? Are you a powerful spellcasting sorcerer? Are you a holy cleric? Or are you the relatively situational ranger or the relatively bland fighter? That's what the point we're getting at today. You see, both of those classes I just mentioned, Ranger and Fighter, have a reputation almost as far back as the history of D&D &D itself for being bland, or vanilla, or even underpowered compared to what some of the other classes can do. Uh, they don't have access to either very limited access to spells or no spells whatsoever. They don't have the advanced combat power of someone like the monk or the barbarian. And they don't have anywhere near the skill abilities of the rogue or the bard. So, how do you address that? Well, I'd like to give a couple of steps that I believe address it rather well. Step one, follow all the rules. And, what are you talking about, Adam? Of course we follow the rules. It's a game. You have to follow all the rules. But, do you? Uh, it's not entirely unnatural in a game such as Dungeons & Dragons, which is far more complicated and involved than something like Monopoly or Risk or a regular family board game, for new players and people teaching new players to simply negate some of the more complicated and intricate rules of the game. Of particular note being carry weights, that is, the your strength score can determine how much weight you can actually carry on your body, on your person, and spell components, that is, how much you have to pay to be able to gather the required spell components for an individual spell. <clears throat> Just introducing these two rules, which are, in my experience, pretty commonly overlooked rules for beginner players, rightly so, just implementing those two automatically increases the use and utility of a character like the fighter or the ranger, who might have the higher strength score and not need to spend as much on spell components, like some of the weaker, frailer or more resource-heavy classes. Now, of course, there are far more rules, you know, to follow, such as concentration check for spells, encumbrance of armor, stuff like that. For example, the fighter has an ability, armor training, 
where they're able to wear armor yet still utilize a lot of their mobility and dexterity, which is a great ability. However, if armor encumbrance isn't a thing you're playing with, that ability is moot and void, and you're not able to use it. But then what about the ranger? A lot of the stuff I was talking about, well, that has to do with the fighter. What about the ranger itself? Well, that sort of ties into step number two, which is be a better DM. Now, that sounds rather judgmental and harsh of me, but I'll get to what I'm saying here in a minute. I'm not necessarily trying to judge anyone. However, within the sort of ranks of Dungeons & Dragons playing, there are essentially two types of play styles that seem to be most dominant. There is the sort of RP-focused, role-playing focused, story-driven sort of you're going from fight to fight, but only insofar as it concerns the actual story that your Dungeon Master is unfolding for you. Then, secondly, there's the challenge-style Dungeons & Dragons where your DM is not necessarily your guide and your storyteller, but your opponent. It's very much one-on-one, -on -one. I'm going to throw as much at my party as possible to stop them, instead of aid them. Now, I'm not going to say, if you play this style of Dungeons & Dragons, that you're inherently wrong. It is a game that lets you play the way you like, and if you and your group like to play like that, that is fine. However... The, ra the fighter, and particularly the ranger, have several class features that, if you know about it, are extremely easy to hamper. The ranger, for example, one of their primary abilities is favored enemy. Whereas if they're fighting a particular type of enemy, be it goblinoids or dragons or oozes or constructs, they get bonuses to damage and attack, and also a plethora of other checks. If you're a challenge DM and you know that there's a ranger there with a particular favorite enemy, not that difficult for you to simply not include that enemy in the game at all, and suddenly your party's ranger is pretty freaking useless, because they also have something called favored terrain, which does kind of the same sort of thing. You get extra attack and mobility options when you're in that terrain. And if you're a challenge DM and you know what your ranger's favorite terrain is, just don't include it ever, and suddenly two of their class features are entirely useless. Um, of course, I'm not saying you have to be the pandering baby, oh, I'm here to help you sort of DM if that's not what you want to do, but, you know, mix it up. If you have a good variety of enemies, particularly for a higher level ranger, your chances of not managing to include an enemy that or terrain style that your ranger happens to have are relatively low, particularly over a longer game. Hopefully you'd be encountering many types of terrain and enemies, and you'd eventually come across at least a couple where your ranger can start to shine. Also, while we're talking about following game rules, the ranger has a lot of abilities having to do with survivalism. You know, being in the wild, gathering food, hunting for animals, setting up traps, stuff like that. And if you play without rules for that kind of thing, if you play, you know, simply encounter to encounter, fight to fight, those things aren't going to be pertinent. And wrapping that up, let me bring me on to the third point. Instead of keeping this all in the Dungeon Master, step three is be a better player. Again, I'm not meaning to sound entirely harsh. What I mean to say is, as a player, it's not a bad idea to simply learn the abilities and capabilities of your friend's characters. That way you can better play together. It's something I've actually seen a lot, unfortunately, among both new and veteran players alike, where players will take their turns as their own turn. They'll sit there, wait for their turn to come by, do their actions, and then sit there again waiting and waiting for their turn. But if you play Dungeons & Dragons like the cooperative experience that it's supposed to be, you 
can very easily, you know, talk around the table, be like, okay, I'm going to do this this turn, but if when I do that, that'll allow you to do this. And you'll be like, all oh, right, I can do that if you do this. So I'm going to do this thing, which means you guys can do these things, and that'll do that, and it'll be incredible and amazing. Sadly, I've only really been in a couple of games where that's been true. And in one of them, it was far more of a bossing around kind of scenario. One experienced player is being like, oh no, you have to do this and that, and you guys have to do that and this so that I can do this and I'll win us the fight. Which is somewhere you don't want to be at all. So, what am I saying in general? Well, what I'm saying is... A lot of work and time has gone into these systems, right? The game that I play, Pathfinder, is an advanced version of the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons. And Dungeons & Dragons itself is on the fifth edition of its print run. These are balanced experiences if you're utilizing it and kind of, quite frankly, playing it correctly. Of course, if you are, if you do have a relatively inexperienced group or you don't care about all this minutia and stuff, then that's just fine. As one Joe Kitty of Crap Guide to D&D fame said, at the end of the day, it's not about the numbers you're putting up, it's about how much fun you're having. That's really all there is to it. And if you are playing with an experienced group who are used to putting up these numbers, then, well, introducing all of the rules, improving your abilities as a DM and as a player to co be cooperative around the table shouldn't be that big of a deal for you. But anyway, that's just my sort of social commentary on the state of tabletop gaming. <clears throat> maybe, maybe you disagree, maybe you agree. Let me know in the comments below and let me be a shameless shill and tell you to like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> and hope that I get better soon, because this kind of sucks, I would like to be able to go into work again. Well, that's about all from me. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.